It's Thursday. That means crossover Thursday on the Locked On NFL channel on the Locked On Podcast Network. This time, Alex Clancy, Locked On Cardinals, Corbin Smith, Locked On Seahawks. Corbin, we've talked recently. A lot has changed and a lot has kind of still stayed the same for both teams. We're going to break this all down here on this edition of Crossover Thursday and the Locked On NFL portion of the Locked On Podcast Network. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their prize pick projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on your entry. First time users can get 100% instant deposit match up to 100 bucks with promo code locked on. That's prizepicks.com slash promo code locked on. Now, Corbin Smith of Locked On Seahawks, if you told me, if you told you eight weeks in to the NFL season, the 2022 season, that the Seattle Seahawks would have a comfortable ish lead through eight weeks five and three leading the division would you've asked to drug test me would you've asked to drug test yourself either way we're looking at a five and three seahawks team leading the nfc west almost halfway through the 2022 nfl season i think it would have turned into a community drug testing like all <laughs> of us need to say there's no yeah. way you know and Here's the thing. I mean, I made it clear to you guys in our NFC West roundtable before the season. I thought Seattle was going to be better than a lot of people were yes, picking them to be. But I did not think after eight weeks that they would be two games above 500 and that they would be in first place and have the number three seed in the NFC. I did not see that coming. And so, yeah, really the difference now, this three-game winning streak. When we were talking, the Cardinals were actually the first team the Seahawks beat to start that winning streak, and they started that at home. This defense had been so putrid the first five weeks. They were probably the worst in the NFL. And the last three weeks, you could make an argument they're the best defense in the league in the last three games. They just turned everything over overnight with some subtle uh, schematic adjustments, especially with how they're using their defensive line. Their front line is getting after people. They're getting a bunch more sacks. The pressure is really paying dividends in the back end. And, of course, they've got really good young corners that they're fired up about. Their safeties are playing at a really high level. Ryan Neal is making them not forget Jamal Adams the last yeah. couple of weeks, the way that he's playing. And their linebackers have been solid. They don't need their linebackers to be all pro caliber if the other players are playing at a really high level. And those two are getting their job done, Jordan Brooks and Cody Barton. So it really has been a 180-degree turn for this defense. And there were question marks about how legit their turnaround defending the run was. And then they go out and they hold Saquon Barkley to 53 rushing yards and just 2.7 yards per carry. It looks like these changes they've made, this is not a fluke, just like Geno Smith is proving week in, week out, that his performance is not a fluke. Yeah, and you know, the interesting win-loss, uh, you know, I'm looking at their schedule, and we'll get to the Cardinals here in a second, but you could say they've had somewhat of an, the teams that they've beat, beaten have been you know, the Giants had a very good record, okay? And the Chargers, they beat the week before, was like, okay, this is serious now. Like, the Chargers have one of the best rosters in the NFL. I know they're decimated by injuries, but the Seahawks, even though the schedule looks a little bit on the lighter side, which it's not because it's an NFL schedule, this is a real 5-3. and three. Like, this is a real 5-3. and three. This isn't, like, if you put the Vikings and them in a seven-game series, I may be picking Seattle at this point. Because you said about the defense, we were talking with Kenneth Walker emerging as now that that pick looks absolutely genius. It's like, well, the back the backfield is is so is so packed, and it's like, well, now it's not, and now you have an RB one. Now moving to the Cardinals side, still don't know what the root of the problem is. Still don't know what the root of the problem is on offense. Now Kyler Murray threw two bad interceptions last week. The offense hummed for two fantastically long drives that resulted in touchdowns. Having DeAndre Hopkins back is going to be a glaring difference between the last time the Seahawks played the Cardinals and now. But we still don't know. Is this defense just not that good? Or is the offense putting the defense in precarious situations to where no defense of, you know, of average grade would be able to hold up? And I don't know what the answer is still. And we're eight weeks in. The Cardinals should have beat Minnesota. Three turnovers, they should have beat Minnesota. They were the better team on the field more than the Vikings were the better team on the field, uh, uh, conversely speaking. The storyline going into week nine is, has Cliff lost the locker room? I don't know if he has. It, it, it's a question that I ask. Is it so blatantly clear that Cliff Kingsbury is in over his head? Or is the defense not equipped to be able to play second fiddle and backup dancer to an offense that's obviously struggling? 
Like, we don't know here what the problem is. We know there's a problem, but as I mentioned to you a couple weeks ago, have, having a problem is only worse, it, it is only second worst to not knowing what the root of the problem is. And we still don't know what the root of the problem is in Phoenix. So coming into town, Seattle Seahawks, if the Seahawks can move to six and four, sweet mother, that's as close to a stranglehold as you maybe see two-game lead in the NFC West this year. So, and I know we're going to get to the key matchups and everything, and I've gone on my diatribe about the Cardinals, but what you saw in that game, the 19-9 to win against Seattle, let's go back to that because they played recently. Were you surprised that the defense, that that was the real game where it's like the defense just said, clamp, 10 minutes and 40 seconds in, your offense isn't scoring another point. Were you surprised by how dominant that defense was the last time the Cardinals played them? Yeah, I mean, as I told you, I was expecting it to be a high-scoring affair just because this defense hadn't been able to stop anybody. There had been some signs that maybe this defense was getting close to turning the corner, but it wasn't showing up on the scoreboard. They weren't winning situational football. They were giving up way too many third downs. They were having issues with penalties, and they have cleaned both those areas up. The run defense has been much better, and really – that was the game that kind of got things turned there, and they have been playing more aggressively with their front line, which, honestly, they had to make that change at some point. I know they wanted to run a 3-4 with read and react defensive linemen, but the personnel did not did not match up. Puna Ford is a penetrating defensive tackle. He's athletic, uber-athletic guy. Quentin Jefferson is a little under 300 pounds. He's not going to be winning as a – read and react defensive lineman, but he can cause problems splitting gaps. They've got a lot of guys like that. And so just letting their front line play, that's what they started doing in that Cardinals game. And you could see with how they were able to get to Kyler Murray, penetrate the pocket, wreak havoc. They were doing a solid job containing. You take the 42-yard run on the first drive out of the equation, and they shut him down running the football most of the game too. So it really surprised me. But now that I've seen it three games in a row, it feels like this is not one of those, oh, that was just a fluky performance or two. They're, they've done it now three weeks in a row. And in the NFL, that always speaks volumes, regardless of the opponent. And, and the Giants, I left that game last week. I know they only put up 13 points, but mm-hmm. you can see why they're winning football games. Yeah, They're extremely well coached. They're physical. They're tough. And they hung around. They found ways to make that game close. And Seattle ended up reversing their fortunes in the fourth quarter. The Giants had killed teams in the fourth quarter. Seattle said, nah, not happening, and beat them 14-0 because they were able to create another turnover in special teams, and Geno Smith was coming up with clutch plays down the stretch. So they really seemed to put together a very balanced offensive and defensive football team. Now, can they do it twice to the Cardinals? That's really the big storyline here, especially when you have such a short gap between games. And, oh, by the way, DeAndre Hopkins is now playing – that is a pretty stark difference from what the Seahawks were going against a few weeks ago at Lumen Field. So can you do it twice in four weeks? That is never easy, regardless of the opponent that you're going against, especially on the road. At Corbin Smith NFL on Twitter, he hosts Locked on Seahawks Monday through Friday, free and available wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Alex Clancy, Locked on Cardinals. Follow me on Twitter at Clancy's Corner. We'll give our key matchups in the second segment, and I get to ask Corbin Smith, my buddy, a question again. Four weeks in four weeks since I asked him last time to start the third segment, which could take over the whole third segment. And we're going to talk about it. He doesn't know what I'm going to ask him yet, but it's going to be fun. All of that is next on a crossover Thursday brought to you by prize picks. But first I get to talk to you about blue Nile. Okay. Blue Nile. Not everybody can be like Corbin Smith who found probably the perfect engagement ring. Just got married a couple months ago. Congratulations. Um, blue Nile offers the largest selection of independently graded diamonds and pieces priced significantly below traditional retailers. Blue Nile has helped millions of couples create their perfect engagement ring. Their easy online tools let you choose the diamond shape, size, and and clarity, as well as setting style. But the cool part is, for people that are kind of layman when it comes to this, like me, Blue Nile has 24-7 support via phone or over chat to help you find a memorable gift at every budget. So if you have no idea what the hell you're doing, they've got you covered 24-7, man. There's 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. So they'll help you out year-round. Shop stress-free with Blue Nile's 100% satisfaction guarantee, and all Blue Nile orders are insured and shipped for free in discreet packaging. They also offer overnight shipping if you're in a rush. Make your moment sparkle with Blue Nile. Go to BlueNile.com 
and use code locked on to save fifty dollars on your purchase of five hundred bucks or more. That's b l u e n i l e dot com code locked on to save fifty dollars on your purchase of five hundred dollars or more. Blue Nile dot com code locked on. Crossover Thursday, Corbin Smith, Alex Clancy, Seahawks at State Farm Stadium to play the Arizona Cardinals after a rousing 19-9 loss by the Cardinals, victory by the Seahawks in Lumen Field not a month ago. The teams are in moving in different directions. And the Cardinals sit at 3-5 and five in the cellar of the NFC West, while the Seahawks are atop in their ivory tower and it's been a weird season. The 49ers season's weird. The Rams season's weird. But the interdivisional matchups are going to be fascinating over the next handful of weeks. Now, there's a bunch of key matchups with DeAndre Hopkins back in the fold. It, 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 I'm assuming that's going to be one of the matchups for Corbin. I'll go first here. A couple of matchups for me is the run defense versus now a confident Kenneth Walker. That's not to say that he wasn't confident earlier in the season. That's not to say that he wasn't confident, you know, when the Cardinals played him and before that. What this is saying now, when he broke the tackle for the long touchdown run last week, that was the introduction of Kenneth Walker as an RB1 in the NFL. He is big. He is strong. He runs kind of like James Conner does, kind of an upright fashion. And the dude is an absolute mauler coming out of Michigan State. He got all the carries. He was a three down back in college. And now he goes into a what's supposed to be a run first offense, even though Geno Smith is blowing the roof off. It is the run defense for me against Kenneth Walker, as well as, I've said this, I'll continue to say it, Cliff Kingsbury versus Kyler Murray and the offense. What the hell is this offense going to do? It doesn't matter who the defense is. This is an internal struggle that the Cardinals are facing right now. Can the Cardinals find the elixir, find the jet stream, find the ability to throw the clocks back to last year in the beginning of the season where this offense was humming and moving on all cylinders. So it's more theory-based than this player's number versus this player's number. It's the run defense versus Kenneth Walker and Kyler Murray versus Cliff Kingsbury. And what the hell this offense is going to do. See, and I'm going to look number versus number because we've got Nuke Hopkins back and Tariq Woolen going up against him. I mean, this is the kind of matchup that scientists are looking forward to because you know the physical tools and how much of a freak that DeAndre Hopkins is and the one-handed grabs that he makes. And on the other side, Cardinals fans got a nice introduction to Tariq Woolen a few weeks ago when he recovered a fumble and had an interception against Hollywood Brown in coverage. And that ended up being a play that may have put Brown out for the rest of the season. We'll see what ends up happening on that front. But uh, they got introduced to him such a freak in his own right. He's six foot four with four two six speed. You just don't see cornerbacks coming into the league like that. But this is going to be the toughest challenge that he has had in his entire NFL career. And the Cardinals have had Hopkins on the left side most of the time. That just happens to be where Tariq Woolen is at. So he is going to get tested. He's going to be challenged a lot in this game. Kyler Murray's been looking to throw the ball to Hopkins frequently, which if he wasn't, you'd be checking his brain cells because why would you not be throwing at DeAndre Hopkins? So Tariq Woolen, teams have been staying away from him. I do not expect that Kyler Murray is going to do that if he's got Hopkins on that side and Woolen's going against him. He is going to test him with who he believes is still the best receiver in football. And Tariq Woolen, hey, this is a great chance for you to show that you're not only a rookie of the year candidate. I've been saying he should be an all-pro selection with the way he's played. Hey, if you want to really put yourself in the all-pro map, go out and have a strong performance against DeAndre Hopkins. So that is a matchup when the Cardinals on offense. I am absolutely, I I am enthralled by I am going to get my popcorn ready in the press box, and I'm going to be watching (laughs) that matchup individually because I just think there's going to be some fireworks. We might see Hopkins win some battles there, but I think Tariq Woolen's going to have something to say, maybe get a pick or two if Kyler gets a little bit too aggressive going after him. So that is a really fun matchup. On the flip side, when the Seahawks are on offense, last time these two teams met, the Seahawks actually had maybe their worst offensive game aside from week two against the 49ers when they only scored seven points, and that was off a blocked field goal by Tariq Woolen. The offense did nothing that game. The Arizona game really was a struggle for them, and they got down to the red zone several times, could not finish drives, but they got the field goals that the Cardinals did not, and that really ended up being one of the difference makers. Really, for me, it is going to boil down to DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. They've been battling some injuries to their lower body. Both had a touchdown last week. Tyler Lockett should have had three 
had a really rough game, but he came back and got one touchdown in the fourth quarter, redemption time. They need those two players to step up. The, the Cardinals obviously have had their issues with tight ends. Seattle took advantage of that a few weeks ago. But I think if you're going to win on the road at State Farm Stadium against a desperate Cardinals team that badly needs a win, you've got to find a way to get DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett more involved. They had very quiet games in that first match. And I think if you're going to win on the road, especially with the Cardinals now having Hopkins back and I'm expecting able to score more points, they need some big plays on the outside from their star receivers. Can they get it done against the Cardinals secondary that really did a great job bracketing both them in that game and really limiting their opportunities? Can they get it done this time? That is a big question mark for me. But certainly, you know, Geno Smith is going to be trying to get the football to him, though he's been much more patient than his predecessor when it comes to really pushing the issue downfield throws. For sure. And well said. And I, and I will give an honorable mention. The offensive line's been banged up. DJ Humphreys is still day-to-day left tackle for the Cardinals. Ronnie Hudson is in danger of missing it another game in a row, which is puts the Cardinals offensive line, obviously um, behind the eight ball. Um, Kyler Murray's ability to make plays down the field with it, while also minimizing the bad throws. He had two really bad throws that resulted in interceptions. One of which looked to be a miscommunication. The other one, he tried to outthrow Robbie Anderson and Robbie Anderson's really fast. And he just ran right by it. It was their second game. You know, it was, it was 10 days in or two weeks into Robbie Anderson's tenure as an Arizona Cardinal. So it should tighten up a little bit. You'd think with that all in all, we're going to find out a lot. If the Cardinals can win this game, we're going to talk about our projections next, or predictions next. If the Cardinals can win this game and the Seahawks lose this game, it's going to put even more questions and storylines into the NFC West more than there already are because it hasn't been the sexiest like it like it was last year for a lot of the teams in the NFC West, but it's, it's captivating and fascinating because there's so many potentials for all of these organizations for the future. Like, are the Rams going to blow it up? Are the 49ers Super Bowl contenders? Is Seattle worth... What, what it looks like the word, do they need to add players? Are the Cardinals going to blow everything up? Like if the Cardinals win and Seattle loses, it's like, well, NFL, right when you think you know something, they give you the opposite. And, and we're going to find out on Sunday. We're going to give our predictions for the game. And I'm going to ask the question. I've been waiting 17 minutes and 13 seconds to ask Corbin Smith to start off the next segment. I'm going to talk about it. And we are going to roll on here on a crossover Thursday. Um, but I get to talk first about bet online. Okay. Bet online is your number one source for all your sports wagering information. The line is fluctuated here where the Cardinals were favorites with the opening line. I think it's dropped down a little bit. I think the Cardinals opened it as three point favorites, according to bet online. Um, but the, the best part about bet online, in my opinion, is that they've got the, you want to pick who's going to win the NFC South. You can bet on it. You want to pick who's going to win the AFC East. You can bet on it. It's not just games. It's they've got a bunch of different futures. MVP, division, conference, who's going to make the Super Bowl? They've got a whole bunch. As always, Bet Online remains your continued source for all your sports wagering information with live betting and up to the up to the minute scores for every sport out there. The fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite games and events, including Major League Baseball, MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online, where the game starts. Alex Lancy locked on Cardinals. Corbin Smith. Locked on Seahawks at Corbin Smith NFL for him on Twitter at Clancy's Corner for me. You can check us out free and available wherever you get your podcast Monday through Friday. We're going to give our predictions and give our thoughts, our key players. Corbin Smith will and should the Seattle Seahawks extend Geno Smith tomorrow? Or are we going to wait until the end of the year? And tomorrow is, is loosely defined. Are they going to give him an extension mid season? Or are they going to wait till the end of the year and weigh their options? I don't know that the Seahawks are going to do that, but this is the difference in answer for me now from a few weeks ago. I think maybe a month ago, Geno Smith and his agent, they might be hopping at the opportunity to get a two- or three-year contract. But I think with the way Geno's playing now, if his agent is smart, you're saying, nah, you know, we're not really interested in talking about a contract right now. We want to hit free agency or, at minimum, force you to use the franchise tag on my client. And we can be guaranteed a 30 plus million dollar payday next year. And so I don't anticipate there's going to be an extension coming. Maybe the Seahawks would have some interest in striking up a conversation. And maybe with where Geno Smith at in his career, just being happy in Seattle, maybe he's not going to be looking at the maximum money situation and be like, look, I can get two or three years of security here. Let's do this right now. But I don't see that happening. I just think the way that he's playing now, eight weeks into the season, 
it wouldn't be smart. I think you you play this out, you finish the season hopefully strong. If you get the Seahawks in the playoffs, they make some noise in the playoffs, then you're just making yourself money this offseason, whether it's in Seattle or with somebody else. So I, I think the Seahawks are certainly probably considering this possibility now. I just don't see – I don't see Geno Smith as agent being like, you know what, we're going to entertain this in the middle of the season. No, they're going to want to wait until the end of the year. Pop quiz, because I just looked it up. I had no idea. Real time. Do you know how much Geno Smith has made in his career? Like, if you look this up? Whew. Probably less than $25 million for his career. $13.9 million. How is that possible? He's been in the league 10 years, 13.9, average 1.3 a year. He had, you know, it, so yeah, absolutely. It's like, you know what? You're playing with house money at this point. So if they don't, if they don't fall off a cliff, which it doesn't seem like they will, he's always been a stable guy, but this is the theory that I have. We're going to get to our, our predictions. We're going to talk Cardinals also. Not starting quarterbacks their whole life. They've always been the best player on the field or close to it. When you go into a backup role, it's hard to just come in and play mid game. It's hard to start a couple games here and there where you don't have the, you know, the rapport with these players. Like I talk about in basketball a lot. It's hard, like Russell Westbrook. It's very difficult for somebody who started their whole career just to start coming off the bench. Not everybody's Lou Williams and Jamal Crawford who can just do it. So it's yeah. interesting. When Geno Smith has had some time, he's had the ability to build rapport with these two young, one young, one youngish receivers. That's fascinating that you think that he's just saying, you know what? I'm good. Let's see what happens, yo. Like, let, let, let's see how good this season can finish and see if I can get a payday. That's fascinating to me. Now, this game, players of the game, give me your impact players of players that will make an impact of this game one way or the other. Well, starting on defense, I got to start with a player I name dropped earlier. Mm -hmm. This team really missed Jamal Adams the first few games. And this is not a shot at Jamal Adams. Jamal Adams being healthy would help this team a lot, especially with his blitzing ability. I think this new scheme that they had was perfectly catered for him to maximize his unique talents. But Ryan Neal, the last two weeks, has been playing like an all-pro caliber safety. That is not an exaggeration. Two weeks ago, he had four pass breakups and the interception in one game against Justin Herbert and the Chargers. This past weekend against the Giants, he stuffed Saquon Barkley for a three-yard loss on a screen play. He had another tackle for a loss, and then he had another tackle that he made that the receiver ended up being a yard short of the first down marker because he blew him up. This guy's flying all over the place. I look at this game. He got to Kyler Murray a few weeks ago and sacked him on a safety blitz. They ran some fire zones in that game. I'm expecting they're still going to be sprinkling some of those in with him coming after the quarterback because of his athleticism and his ability to chase after Kyler Murray. And I also think he's going to be an important player in coverage, especially if they decide to do some bracketing stuff on DeAndre Hopkins. You could very well see Ryan Neal doing that. So on defense, Ryan Neal, to me, is a crucial player. And I mentioned Metcalf and Lockett. DK Metcalf needs to have a big game for the Seahawks to win on the road. And he played fairly well when they were in Arizona last year. But he had a very quiet game. The Cardinals give him a ton of credit. That was something they did a really good job a few weeks ago. The Seahawks have to figure out what are some ways we can get the football in his hands. If the Cardinals are doing the same stuff they did last time where they're constantly double-teaming him, Find some ways to get some quick screens to him or get some slants, in routes, whatever. Get the football in your playmaker's hand. And if you keep doing it over and over again, you're going to force the Cardinals to make some adjustments. And some of those over-the-top throws can open up. I just think DK is going to have to be a big factor for this offense. He wasn't last time they got away with it. I don't think you can have that this rematch. And so to me, Metcalf is the player to keep a really close eye on that needs to have a big game for the Seahawks to win at Glendale. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, because Tyler Lockett's been a four-letter word. We've talked about this. Tyler Lockett's actually punished the Cardinals. It doesn't matter. doesn't matter where they're I, I think he's more impacted by the lower body injuries right now Maybe. than yeah, well, what yeah. DK Metcalf. Metcalf, to me, last week looked like typical DK Metcalf. Yes, he did. Lockett yes, he did. still looks to me like he's not quite himself. He's still making plays, but th that might be the biggest reason I'm throwing Metcalf out there, too. Sure, absolutely. Um you know, uh, Rodney Hudson officially out. I, I don't know if I mentioned that before. So the center is officially out. My key matchup is Kyler Murray versus the pass rush of like, like it, Kyler Murray. You know, normally you take away the quarterback with these things where it's like, okay, the quarterback's obviously the most impactful player. Like you kind of remove him from all the conversations. I can't. I can't. It has to be him. They go as he goes. 
And he hasn't necessarily regressed this year, but he hasn't taken that step forward that people expected him to in his fourth year. This is the year that most quarterbacks really emerge as pro quarterbacks, elite quarterbacks, if they're going to get there. I think the jury's still out on him. He needs to have a game. He needs to have a 300-yard passing, two or three touchdown passing game to remind people that he can be elite. It's going to be difficult for all the defensive reasons you've mentioned during the last 25 minutes of this podcast. But he's one where it's like, it's got to happen. It's got, it's got to be him. It's got to happen. And then it's going to be Byron Murphy versus whoever it's going to be, Tyler Lockett or DK Metcalf. DK Metcalf hasn't fared very well for the, over the, for the Arizona, against the Arizona Cardinals over the last couple seasons, uh, save him you know, tracking down Buda Baker. And it's something that no human should ever be able to do, but he did on Sunday Night Football on that flex game a couple years ago. It's going to be Byron Murphy and Kyler Murray. Those are the two that I'm going to be watching because if Kyler Murray continues to not put up numbers like we saw last year, and this is where it's coming into crunch time because their record isn't isn't ideal through eight weeks. There's going to be questions swirling. Oh, is it is it Cliff? Is it Kyler? Is it is it both? Should they trade? Like it? It's not going to get easier. So the Cardinals and Kyler Murray really need to solidify themselves from the quarterback position, regardless of how the offensive line looks come game day. Now, I know neither of us, you or, or I, really love giving an actual number, a score prediction, but you have to. So. Give yours. <laughs> well, nobody says that I have to. <laughs> Our friends over at Bet Online have the odds here, and the Seahawks are plus two going into this game yeah. currently, according to odds. So they're expecting this to be a very tightly contested game. Uh, so based off of that, not to not to sound homerish here, but I do feel like this is a game with the way that the Seahawks are playing right now on both sides of the ball you should be able to get above that two-point threshold against this Cardinals team. And I feel like the Seahawks, you might say house money with the way Geno's playing, but it just seems like right now they are rolling as well as any team not named the Philadelphia Eagles and the Buffalo Bills in the NFL right now, the last three weeks. The defense is playing top five level. The offense maybe hasn't been quite as explosive as it was early in the season, but they're still putting up 26, 27 points minimum most games. So I just think you look at the way they're playing and the fact the Cardinals, it just seems like they can't quite figure out how to get over the hump. Now, maybe this is the game that they do, but Seattle has historically played better against the Cardinals in Glendale. And I just want, I I think that that's going to continue in this game. I think it will be close. I think that it's going to be a game that stayed within seven points. Uh, But that plus two, I mean, I would take the Seahawks on that. I think they're going to find a way to win this game. We'll just leave it at that. I'll have my score prediction on the Blue Friday show. I haven't necessarily thought about actual score, but I do think it's close, but I think the Seahawks are going to cover. And I think that I think the Cardinals are going to win, and let me tell you why. It goes against all conventional wisdom with how the both teams are playing that that would happen, and that's the NFL. Yeah. Like, that's I'll, – I'll take the trump card in whatever game that is. Like, I'll take – I'll take the out the, the outlier reason as why because in the NFL it happens so much. It's not in any given Sunday situation. This isn't, you know, McNeese State versus Michigan, but it's like the Cardinals have enough talent. DeAndre Hopkins has 22 catches and over 260 yards in his two games back. Like they got to play the hits Matt Prater's back, which I know doesn't seem like a huge deal, but the Cardinals have been playing kicker roulette for the last handful of weeks. Matt Prater's back, which should which should calm some nerves a little bit when they're driving there. They know that they can get points inside of 45 with pretty much automatic, with automatic performances by Matt Prater, even though he's at an advanced stage. I'm going to take the Cardinals. I think it's going to be close. And I think that this is just going to put more muddiness into the NFC West. And you know what? I'm here for it. Corbin Smith at Corbin Smith NFL locked on Seahawks Monday through Friday, free and available wherever you get your podcast. Alex Clancy locked on Cardinals at Clancy's corner. We make up the Seahawks and Cardinals crossover Thursday. Uh, Thanks for making Locked On crossover Thursday uh, your first listen. Now make your second listen, Peacock and Williamson, Brian Peacock, Matt Williamson, Monday through Friday, national stories, some of the best in the business that we have on the Locked On Podcast Network. We will see both of you, both of you will see both of us on our respective podcast tomorrow to round out the week. We'll talk to you then.